Welcome and thank you for viewing this webinar on ECMO circuit monitoring, the essentials of pressure and flow as part of the STS 8 and 8 series. The goal of this format is to present a concise discussion on a topic in eight slides in approximately eight minutes. My name is Rita Molesky. I'm a cardiac surgeon at the University of Pennsylvania. I will be joined by Corey Allwert, a perfusionist and assistant professor of surgery at Mayo Clinic Hospital in Phoenix, Arizona. Now, there are many articles, books, and webinars on the indications, cannulation, and management strategies of ECMO, which are patient-focused. However, there are few resources which discuss the management of the circuit itself. Therefore, this presentation is ECMO circuit-focused. For this webinar, we will highlight the essentials of pressure and flow in ECMO circuit monitoring. It's important to realize that the ECMO circuit, like the cardiovascular system, perfuses the body based on pressure and flow. Therefore, the clinical team must be familiar with normal pressures and flows of the ECMO circuit, variances of these ECMO normal circuit pressures and flows, the causes of the variances, and interventions to quickly resolve these variances. The four key pressures to be cognizant of and to monitor in the ECMO circuit are, number one, the venous inflow or drainage pressure, number two, the pre-oxygenator pressure, number three, the post-oxygenator or return pressure, and the delta P or trans-oxygenator pressure. Failure to identify abnormalities in these four pressures and recognize interventions to resolve these can lead to sudden ECMO circuit failure, clinical catastrophes such as embolic stroke. When managing patients on ECMO, it is essential that the clinical team understand the relationship between pressure and flow in the ECMO circuit. The essential axioms for the ECMO circuit are that flow is directly related to pressure and to the fourth power of the radius of the tubing. The bigger the ECMO circuit tubing or cannula, the higher the ECMO circuit is able to flow. Flow is inversely related to viscosity and the length of the tubing. Also, it's important to understand that as flow increases, outlet pressures get more positive and inlet pressures get more negative. Identifying abnormal venous line pressure or pressure trending is important for understanding clinical consequences. Venous line pressure is generated by the active suction provided by the blood pump. Excess negative pressures can cause hemolysis, venous chatter or suction events, and even cavitation of air. These events can occur if the tissue surrounding the cannula gets sucked down around the cannula tip, limiting venous return. Also guidelines say that with the venous line inlet occluded, the suction pressure should not exceed negative 300 millimeters of mercury. This can be accomplished by keeping pump speed minimal or by using servo regulation to ramp down pump speed in response to excess negative pressure. Generally for adults, most would agree that negative 100 millimeters of mercury during support is reasonable beyond which it can start to become problematic. Understanding the etiology of excess negative pressure and how to resolve it is critical. Causes of increased negative venous pressure include excess blood flow for the cannula size, a kink or clot on the drainage side of the circuit, hypovolemia, or external pressures around the drainage vessel, such as tamponade pneumothorax, or high intrathoracic pressure. Similar to venous inflow pressure, identifying abnormal circuit outflow pressures or pressure trending and the clinical consequences is also important. Outflow pressures are positive pressures that are generated by the blood pump. Extreme positive pressures can cause hemolysis, circuit disruption, jetting of the blood, and the fireman's hose effect where the cannula tends to want to pull out of the patient with higher pressure generation. Regarding outflow pressures for the ECMO circuit, ELSO guidelines state that with the outlet line occluded, the outlet pressure should not exceed 400 millimeters of mercury. This can be accomplished by limiting pump speed or by servo regulation to ramp down pump speed in response to excessive negative pressures or positive pressures. Mm -hmm. Generally for adults, most would agree that 300 millimeters of mercury during support is reasonable, beyond which can start to become problematic. Understanding the etiology of increased outflow pressure and how to resolve the pressure is also critical. Causes of increased outflow pressure include excess blood flow for the cannula size, or a kink or a clot on the pressurized circuit, 
pressurized side of the circuit, including the oxygenator itself. As background, perhaps uh, no other innovation over the past 20 years has been as important to the continued growth and clinical application of prolonged mechanical circulatory support with ECMO as the novel polymethylene pentene or PMP oxygenators, which optimize not only biocompatibility and durability, but also the membrane permeability, gas exchange, and flow dynamics. One of the most important ECMO circuit pressures with the most significant clinical consequences is the oxygenator pressure drop or the ECMO transoxygenator pressure. It represents resistance across the oxygenator. And actually trending the ECMO transoxygenator pressure is more important than the absolute value. And acceptable transmembrane pressures with the PMP oxygenator are somewhere in the neighborhood between 10 and 40 millimeters of mercury. One of the most important causes of increased ECMO transoxygenator uh, resistance is the thrombus in the oxygenator. Other causes include increased flow, increased hemoglobin viscosity, and high triglycerides. The most catastrophic outcomes of thrombus on the post-oxygenator side of the membrane oxygenator are arterial embolic events, especially in the brain. Another essential concept of ECMO circuit monitoring is understanding the relationship between ECMO pump speed and ECMO pump flow. Centrifugal pumps are magnetically coupled to the motor and are afterload sensitive. Because of this, understanding and trending the RPM to flow relationship is important. For a given RPM, any increased resistance post pump will cause a decrease in flow. A tubing kink, clot, or an increased mean arterial pressure are some common causes of resistance that can cause decreased flow. Remember that the RPM display shows only how fast the motor is spinning or the set speed and not necessarily how fast the actual impeller is spinning. A clot on the impeller itself may cause drag resulting in an actual speed that is lower than the set speed. Now it's also important to briefly discuss a scenario in which understanding circuit pressure and flow dynamics are important to patient management. For patients on veno-arterial ECMO with peripheral cannulation, if the patient has significant lung damage or ARDS and the left ventricle is ejecting, there will be a transition zone between deoxygenated blood ejected from the left ventricle and oxygenated retrograde blood from the ECMO circuit as seen here. This transition zone can occur anywhere from the descending thoracic aorta to the aortic root. In this scenario, monitoring the right radial oxygenation can indicate how far the oxygenated retrograde blood is being pushed up the aorta and will provide an idea of coronary and carotid oxygenation. Ideally, ECMO blood flow would be maximized in this patient in an attempt to push that transition zone as far up the aorta as possible towards the, the aortic root as seen in figures B and C. Understanding circuit pressures and flow dynamics will guide the decision as to whether or not you can increase blood flow to accomplish this. If your circuit pressures are within reasonable limits, you may attempt to increase uh, ECMO blood flow. However, if your circuit pressures are at maximum, other strategies will have to be considered for improving coronary and carotid oxygenation, for example, VAV ECMO. Thank you again.